Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here with you, James. Thanks for that introduction. Trend Micro and Alma, thank you very much for in inviting me and including me. And I'm going to build on what Martin just said um, and, and really talk about how to, you know, some of the, the trends that he talked about and, and, and double click and bring them a little bit down into more detail. I don't know how many of you in the audience actually know that the internet just turned uh, 51 last week. Um, and it was uh, the, the transmission of data between two universities on the west coast of the United States that really opened the internet. But as you know, the internet was uh, designed as a alternative communications channel for uh, US military and was intended really as an academic and a military platform. It was never designed to be the backbone of the global economy, moving goods, data, services, and capital across borders. And so it's no wonder that we're at where we're at 51 years later of talking about the threats to this digital infrastructure. As Martin said, the pandemic showed us the importance of the internet um, and how critical it was to keeping our countries going, keeping our companies moving those the data and services around the world, our schools open, even though it's online versus in person, and overall keeping us as society um, you know, uh, together uh, through these different platforms. And, and while the social impact is significant, could you imagine if the internet was unavailable and that you didn't have the ability to connect and see each other online, what we're doing this morning? The telecommunications infrastructure though, it really in order to have a, not have a digital divide and enable us is we have to have affordable, available and reliable internet. And unfortunately, many of you in the Southeast Asia can't afford the unlimited stable internet connection um, and internet penetration does really matter. Uh, there are certain parts of the Philippines that have great connectivity, and there are other parts of the Philippines that don't have good connectivity. I was recently in Indonesia and, and other parts of Asia, and where you're starting to see, you know, only 45 or 50 percent of the population has access to affordable, available, and reliable internet. And we really have to close that gap in order to enable us to uh, get through this pandemic and see the other side of the digital transformation. The digital transformation is well underway though. In 2020, the COVID pandemic has showed us that we have to innovate um, in order to uh, get to the other side is gonna require us to adapt our uh, business skills. It's going to require us to adapt to these new technologies and it's gonna require us to um, really kind of uh, think about new business models as we're going forward. The work from home and the learn from home has uh, has basically shown us a 1,200% increase in use of those collaboration tools, whether it's Microsoft Teams, it's Zoom as this platform, it's WebEx, it's some other uh, Google Meet. It doesn't matter what it is, it's, it's what we're using in order to remain connected in order to keep our business platforms going. We're also seeing the use of these business, of these new platforms and collaboration tools to enable us to use telemedicine and, and the new wearable medical devices and remote diagnostic tools to reduce the need for in-office visits. So you're starting to see this emergent of, emergence of new business models and using the technology that was available about 10 years ago, but is now, on, um, is now being accelerated in its adoption and use. So that digital transformation is well underway um, across all of our businesses and across all of our society and is even bringing our governments along to some degree. Um, and uh, But we face a lot of challenges, I have to tell you. Uh, this, this year has been crazy. The disruptive and destructive activities are increasing. So we're seeing, seeing the criminals steal more sensitive data, intellectual property, your personal data. We're seeing countries compromise medical research and we're seeing hackers knock the actual drug, uh, the drug uh, producers offline in India. We're seeing uh, influence campaigns, propaganda, disinformation at scale in all of our countries, especially around elections. We're seeing disruption of critical services, infrastructures and businesses. Um, uh, the attacks of financial networks and cryptocurrency exchanges to generate revenue. And we are in fact seeing the internet being used to recruit terrorists and direct violent attacks. And the numbers, they really don't look good. For 2020, we've seen a 700 
over 700% increase in ransomware attacks, over 150% increase in distributed denial of service attacks, and over 600% increase in Internet of Things attacks. And that's just this year alone. And I'm seeing a, 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 this growth is going to continue in all three of these areas as we adopt and embed more of these technologies into our lives and how we're changing the way we've gone to work from home, learn from home. Cyber, cyber criminals are also taking advantage of the region. You're seeing 59% increase in phishing and scam and fraud, which I think you're gonna see uh, um, some of the results of this uh, report again, talked uh, during this week at, at Decode. You're gonna see, uh, you see the malware and ransomware being deployed against your networks and infrastructures. Fake news regarding the vaccine or fake news regarding the actual existence of the disease. And then, um, and then malicious domains are popping up at, uh, at a pretty significant scale in your region. So having that general awareness of what's happening is important for the workforce in order to keep your networks as clean as possible. So you have to say, how did we get here? Really, how did we get here? And we got here because over the last 30 years, our governments and our businesses made a conscious decision to connect to these information communications technologies, embed our critical services and infrastructures with these technologies. And these technologies are fundamentally insecure at the outset of when they're sold. And the most products come with the principle of field it fast and fix it later, where Patch Tuesday, as developed by Microsoft, leads to Vulnerable Wednesday. And Patch Tuesday exists for every single software and hardware provider. It's just a question of when is the patch? Is it on a Tuesday? Is it on a Wednesday, et cetera? And just so you know, today, November 10th, is Patch Tuesday. And so tomorrow, on the 11th, it will be Vulnerable Wednesday. And just to give you the sense, um, the the patch uh, patch cadence for this year, with just two of the of the main providers for our business systems, we've had more than a thousand patches uh, made available by Microsoft. Over 15% of them were critical. Critical meaning I can get in through remote code exploitation or through validated credentials through the vulnerabilities in their platform and their software. Um, and I can steal the data, I can illegally copy the data, I can corrupt your data, et cetera. And then Oracle has even more uh, uh, closed at the end of October with 1,600, over 1,600 vulnerabilities addressed of which one third are critical. Um, Oracle is done for this calendar year. And as I said, today is Patch Tuesday for Microsoft. So you will see more than hundred patches, I think announced um, this evening. Um, as uh, you close down your day um, and we open ours. The unpatched systems you should know are very easy to find. You can go to showdown.org, it's a free for service, and you can find everything that's unpatched on Vulnerable Wednesday. And, you know, despite what our governments want to tell us, the tools are cheap and easy. You can get, it's like going to a five and dime store or the dollar store, and they're accessible, affordable, available, and so is software and the, the services. If I don't know how to use the tool, I can just go to the service uh, location and say, this is what I want to buy and this is who my target is. And again, it's quite accessible, easy to deploy. Um, and all I need is a credit card or a Bitcoin, um, any kind of cryptocurrency will work. And so for sale, your national identity is worth a cup of coffee, $3 on the underground um, or in the dark market. And so, uh, and, and you're seeing those national identities used in order to uh, open up bank accounts um, and conduct fraud and, and abuse. You see the delivery of malicious software to your computer only costs a dollar. So I could target Martin, any one of the 70 devices in Martin's smart home, and it will only cost me a dollar to break in. And then I can also conduct a distributed denial of service attack. 
and only cost $10 for an hour, $30 for a day, you know, less than $1,000 for a month. And so that business disruption becomes real. And you as IT professionals have to figure out how you're going to defend against it and make your critical business systems more resilient to these types of attacks based on the vulnerabilities that you're having to deal with on a patch cadence. It only takes seconds to gain access and most penetrations occur against the top eight controls, the consensus audit guidelines or the top 20 SANS controls, which were mirrored in Australia and elsewhere. When you start to think about, do you have an inventory of the authorized and unauthorized devices? You might have before the pandemic, but you probably don't today. Inventory of authorized and unauthorized software. Do you have the configuration down? Do you have a boundary defense? Do you have application security? Can you control the administrative privileges or do you even know what the identity access management privileges are in the organization now? Um, and is it rules-based and roles-based? And these are the things that are being taken advantage of by these criminals and by these nation states. And when you start to think about, you're dealing with over a hundred patches a month from one software vendor, Microsoft, you're dealing with 30 or more from Cisco, you're dealing with 400 from Oracle. It takes you 30 days to implement those patches. Best practice is 30 days. And most organizations, it takes 60 to 90 days, especially for the Oracle patches, because you have to bring your entire organization down offline and make sure it doesn't break any of the other software systems it's interoperating with. And then small businesses don't ever patch. So when you think about it, if you are the CISO, the chief information security officer, or you're the chief information officer, or you're the chief risk management officer, whatever your role is, you're just dealt with the last 120 from last month's patch Tuesday and get ready for tonight, you're gonna have another 100 or more. And then tomorrow, if you're using Huawei, it'll be Wednesday, it's patch Wednesday for the Huawei products. And then Thursday, you might see a Cisco release. And so it's very difficult to maintain and keep up. And the average organization, once they've got a breach, it takes them over six months to actually contain it. And if it has really destructive and malicious software, um, it will take over 300 days, 315 days to really deal with it, contain it, detect, contain, and restore your overall business operations, which if you think about that, the value at risk of your organization is quite significant if you can't keep up with Patch Tuesday, because Vulnerable Wednesday will get you. So what's at risk? Well, your money is at risk, your personal money. And if you are responsible for a financial institution, the money that you are supposed to be the good steward of is also at risk because these, um, you know, the breaches, the distributed denial of service attacks against these organizations usually come with a side channel of malicious software. And to steal that personal identifiable information, your banking information, which ends up being real money. Your personal identifiable information, and now even more importantly, your personal health information have monetary value in the underground economy and to nation states who are trying to advance their uh, research and development of drugs to heal us from COVID or from cancer or from any other really kind of malicious virus or disease. We're seeing intellectual property theft at scale um, where uh, companies have had their uh, uh, information illegally copied, their trade secrets illegally copied um, to advance another company or another country's interests. So they don't have to actually invest in the research and development. They can actually steal the information and advance their own interests without the actual costs. We're seeing business disruption, the free flow of goods, services, data, and capital across borders are being disrupted through denial of service, through censorship, and maybe more importantly, ransomware these days, 715% increase in ransomware. And the average organization spends 19 days offline when they needed to be online from ransomware. And then finally, <clears throat> we are seeing the deployment of destructive malicious software is being used against corporations as the target of the proxy and disputes among countries. So what's at risk? a lot. And what will you lose? A lot. It depends on which industry you're in and how um, robust your defenses are and how resilient you are meantime to recover or restore those systems. So I'm just going to go through a few examples. 
If you're a financial institution, 25% of the SWIFT customers have been breached. Why is that? Well, SWIFT had a, a vulnerability in its code and, um, and many institutions have not actually implemented the Patch Tuesday from SWIFT. Uh, more importantly, if they have, then sometimes the criminal had already mapped all of their the, the banking's infrastructure and policies, and then you're starting to see business email compromise against the bank for actually moving data and moving money, more importantly, to illegal transfers of, uh, of money and data. You're seeing protected data access. Cathay Pacific had uh, an unpatched system that had a vulnerability where the patch was available for more than a decade. And they lost almost 10 million records in 260 countries. China's aviation regulator demanded they suspend all their staff involved. Hong Kong's privacy authority found the company with gross negligence. Um, they paid significant fines and, um, and then finally started to look at their IT systems of the legacy system that had to be patched. It's, it's irresponsible for a company to have a decade old vulnerability that is unpatched. You're seeing this intellectual property losses mounting and we in the United States are seeing still a lot of intellectual property theft coming from China uh, where they are illegally copying data from any one of our industries, oil and gas, defense, electronics, um, and even the medical research community. Uh, and it continues to be a problem that we have to address with, uh, at least bilaterally with China. You saw the disruption of service of TravelX. They, um, again, they had an unpatched system that they knew about in September, delayed the patch that got a ransomware in December. It destroyed, destroyed all of their capital equipment in 70 countries and 1200 locations were inoperable. They were offline for months, actually driven back down to paper and pencil. Um, and they were um, no longer recognized by some of the banks in the UK because of the vulnerabilities that they choose not to patch. You're seeing industrial control systems weaponized um, and uh, where again, their code gets manipulated. And this happened in um, the Middle East where a subsidiary of, uh, of Saudi Aramco had its industrial control systems were manipulated uh, by a foreign actor, uh, turned off the actual safety valves and so that it could have caused a chemical explosion if the, um, the operators hadn't noticed that there was a malfunction in the overall systems. It required a replacement of almost all the industrial control systems in these infrastructures and it required new code to be developed by Schneider Electric, the, one of the major manufacturers of industrial control systems. I know you all have actually read about and probably experienced WannaCry, but this was a, a, a vulnerability that was a Microsoft vulnerability that was exploited by uh, North Korea uh, with a ransomware attack and it affected 150 countries around the world and cost billions of dollars. Most importantly though, it had affected almost one third of the hospitals in England, either directly or indirectly where they could no longer service patients. And it also caused um, actual capital destruction of large uh, machines like x-ray machines, et cetera, um, by locking them up where you can't just reload a Microsoft operating system to an x-ray machine. And that started to cause a, a kind of a conversation of uh, you know, when do we actually announce an emergency patch? But unfortunately, when WannaCry locked everybody online, Microsoft didn't announce that it was an emergency patch. So people and organizations around the world didn't understand um, the importance of the patch that had been released in March and this exploitation happened in May. Six weeks later, uh, Russia actually used the exact same uh, Microsoft vulnerability to exploit um, and conduct widespread destruction and you started to see in a matter of minutes or hours, depending upon how your overall corporation or government infrastructure was constructed, if it was a flat network like AP Mahler Maersk, one of the largest shipping container shipping organizations in the world, uh, they lost their entire enterprise was destroyed in less than four hours. Merck Pharmaceuticals here in the United States lost all of their manufacturing in four minutes. 
Uh, Federal Express, TNT over in Eastern Europe lost everything in less than 45 minutes. And you start to see that there were hundreds of businesses affected all around the world. It was destroying all of the capital equipment, everything that was connected to an IP device. And I would argue that it was over $100 billion in supply chain disruption, and that we still have not economically accounted for all the risks and all the costs associated with one vulnerability that these companies did not patch that caused widespread destruction. Now more and more, we're seeing this human operated ransomware. Um, and this is just one example, the Mays family of uh, ransomware, they've had well over 100 ransomware attacks this year alone in 2020. And it ranges from insurance companies to accounting companies to electronic companies. <clears throat> and, um, and maybe more important, some of the business services and IT services, Cognizant was hit and the Cognizant was hit with their ransomware, but it actually led to second and third order ransomware events for its business um, services that it was providing to its clients. If you're unfamiliar with Maze or any of these ransomware families, the first thing they do is they come in through an unpatched or a vulnerable system and they map your overall network and they begin to exfiltrate the data. Um, so illegally copy it and bring it out. On the phase two, they encrypt all of your systems and all of your data. And then on the third phase, they basically demand the ransom. Um, and the again, the ransomware attacks are significant. Uh, the, the ransom itself is uh, usually somewhere in the order of at least 10 million US. Um, so you first, as a business, are, are disrupted. The second is you have data loss, no matter what. And then, so then third, you're gonna have regulatory fines for not having actually protected the data that you were supposed to be the steward of. Um, and uh, if you pay the ransom, it's still possible that the ransomware operator is going to release your data. Again, it's 19 days is the average of organizations being offline from ransomware. And the value at risk is significant. Think about the cost per minute per hour per day of being offline when you need to be online. Another example is a ransom hospital in, in Germany where a Citrix vulnerability that uh, was uh, available, the patch was available in January of 2020 was exploited just a few weeks ago. It knocked 30 servers offline, um, admission patient records, et cetera. And um, this hospital had to divert patients to other hospitals. And in the diversion of an emergency patient, that patient died. So um, when you start to think about this is, this is a life or death situation. It's not just a financial loss or a business disruption. We're also seeing the health and safety compromise through the products themselves because the medical manufacturers had never really considered the internet and the internet design when they were, um, when they were uh, building these products. So you're seeing product recalls from uh, Abbott Labs for uh, pacemakers, Johnson & Johnson for its uh, insulin pumps, General Electric for its uh, x-ray machines that are storing personal identifiable information in the clear or unencrypted on those networks. And Medtronic has actually recalled almost every single one of its platforms ranging from um, the actual pacemakers to the actual um, insulin pumps because the Bluetooth interface or the interface to them allows you to steal the data or disrupt the actual integrity of the product. So it could, instead of being a life-saving um, device for your, uh, for your life, it could end up uh, being a, uh, a catastrophic event. In the last several months, we are seeing telecommunications infrastructures, cloud and uh, content providers, and significant infrastructure outages occur. Uh, Tata Communications in India had a global outage. IBM had a global outage of its cloud. T-Mobile here in the United States had an eight hour outage of the whole United States, including our emergency services telephone lines. Akamai also had a major outage distributed denial of service attack against them, knocking um, its services offline for, uh, for hours. Sky, TalkTalk, Talk, Virgin Media all had a problem on the same day, not basically closing down London's communications for four hours. 
You're seeing Google and Zoom also have their outages. Microsoft has had four significant outages in the last three weeks, including on their Azure cloud, which is still unpatched. So if you are dependent upon an Azure cloud, you may not actually have the integrity of a backup system. And then Century, Link, Inquinex, Telstra, it goes on. All around the world, we're starting to see the telecommunications infrastructure that is so important to be available for our businesses, for our countries, start to be more fragile and being uh, taken advantage of, um, and that we really must address this vulnerability at a national level in order to ensure that we, as a national level, can keep our businesses, keep our society going. The Secretary General of the United Nations said that the dark side of innovation is, you know, that this that the threats to these technologies is significant, and the cybersecurity threats or our insecurity is escalating, and we really must address that. So I'd like to give you just a few things to as a, uh, to think about to how you should be thinking about reducing your digital exposures, and just to you know leave you as you decode and elevate the conversation this week. How important resilience has to be at the center of your conversation. So first, you really have to think of enterprise risk management needs to think digital. This is not an IT issue. This is a risk management issue that requires the entire organization to understand what's at risk, the value at risk per minute, for, per hour, per day of being offline when you needed to be online. I would argue that our government officials need to understand this as well. Second, we need to raise awareness and develop the skills that I'm showing a, a picture of our of a young population, but we need to reskill the older population. It's very important that we build awareness of the importance of resilience, the importance of um, patching and keeping our systems clean, and then the importance of uh, of developing the broader skill set to be a digital society. Third. You need to keep your clean, keep a clean machine. The most current version of the software, again, today is Patch Tuesday, so tomorrow is Vulnerable Wednesday. Uh, I just, I use Apple products. I just had an Apple update yesterday, updated all of the machines in my, um, in my office and on my phone. You need to be aware of the most current version of the software and download those updates. It's essential to making sure that you're not vulnerable the day after the patch is available. Next, as, as Martin said, you need to use multi-factor authentication and biometrics wherever possible. In the chat window, there was a question about biometrics. Yes, use the biometrics. It's very difficult to steal your fingerprint or your iris scan. If you don't have that a sophisticated um, uh, method for the authentication, have uh, used a process that actually uh, sends a code um, to your cell phone, as Martin said, um, and so that you've got your username and password and some other channel that's sending a, um, a, a number, a numeric code or whatever, so that you can access whatever the data is for that period of time or to conduct that transaction. I also, you must back up your data often. I think of this personally, you must back up your data, but professionally, you must back up your data. The ransomware events are showing that companies do not have adequate backup systems and cannot recover. Um, a mean time uh, to recover from a backup is they're unable to do it. And so therefore many companies are paying the ransom. And that's unfortunate because that means that they don't have the good business practices for business continuity and disaster recovery. Back your data up. If you're using these technologies and you're having these apps, you need to only you need to download apps only from trusted sources, meaning vetted app, either vetted by the actual vendor going directly to the vendor or through a vetted app store like I would use for Apple. Um, and you really need to rule um, the rule of least privilege. Opt out. Almost every single one of these apps is opting you into access to your photos, access to your contact network access to the other apps that are on your um, device. You should rule, you should opt out of almost as much as possible um, in order to protect your information and be knowledgeable when you're opting in. 
um, and what you're going to give access to as it is a side channel for somebody else to gain access and illegally copy your information that you may not want to have copied. You need to also lock your Wi-Fi and, um, and don't use open Wi-Fi anywhere. Um, don't use the default settings for your wireless, um, your wireless uh, router at home um, because those are easily crackable. Uh, so reset the Wi-Fi, set a new password, um, and don't use the open Wi-Fi anywhere. And open Wi-Fi is an open channel to everything on your device. And then finally at work. At work, I want you to identify your most business critical systems, assets, and data sets and protect them like they matter. There's too many organizations that don't know what their critical systems are. They don't know where their critical data sets are. And so therefore they can't protect them because they don't have visibility into them. Second, you need to elevate the digital risks to enterprise risk and govern them. Ensure there's a governance system. And then you have to measure and monitor that value at risk. If you can't tell me what the operational and capital costs are going to be tomorrow on Vulnerable Wednesday, based on your inability to patch those systems for the next 30 days, it means you have homework to do and a communication channel you have to open to your management and your board. And then finally, you need to know, you must know your resiliency and preparedness. Continuity of business and disaster recovery are essential in these days, especially as you're seeing the increase in ransomware and distributed denial of service and malicious software in the, all of the different malicious activities that we're seeing. What is your mean time or what is your recovery time going to be if you had to rebuild your entire enterprise from backup data systems or in the face of really destructive malicious software, you had to rebuild from metal? Those are the questions that you need to be able to answer when a manager asks them, and those will help you be a better IT and professional in the organization to drive the resilience and transformation that is demanded today. The digital transformation is now, and I'm going to end with, you know, are you ready and are you resilient? And those are the questions I would ask every person in the room. And I look forward to returning to the Philippines, hopefully one day soon. And I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have a very great conference and I look forward to your questions. A very good morning to you.